this thing takes, they said, 10 seconds to switch on. So soon you'll be able to hear me, and uh, it'll all be fine, I think. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled that all of you have are here. I've had 500 people come up to me and say, I'm sorry I'm going to miss your talk, and I really did think there was going to be no one here. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> uh, the, um, the talk I'm going to give today is about the renaissance in finite Markov chain theory. Markov chain theory is about 100 years old, and uh, at and around the 1950s or so, it had relegated itself to a chapter in uh, probability books and wouldn't, wouldn't at all be considered a lively topic of interest. And in the past 10 years or so, maybe longer, uh, there's just been a, a Monte Carlo Markov chain revolution, it's called, not by me. Uh, and I want to try to tell you some of the exciting things that are happening. The, um, very broad outline of what's exciting uh, is partially captured there. Um, to begin with, people in statistical mechanics in areas like quantum chemistry and all kinds of parts of physics wanted to do computations that they needed to do that were difficult to do in any other way than by running a Markov chain. They wanted to sample from probability distributions on very, very high dimensional space, things like fancy versions of the icing model. And the only way that it's possible to do that, really, is to take a configuration and wiggle it around in a Markovian way. And, uh, and the wiggling around is carefully chosen so that in the long run, you are, are doing what you want to do. Uh, and and that, that, you know, millions of times a day people do run Markov chains to do practical computations. Um, in my own area of, of statistics, uh, again, there's been a revolution in um, uh, Bayesian statistics and in other areas where people are able to use the computer using Markov chains in order to compute things that we only dreamed of um, 20 years ago, and again, it's very, very actively used. Another component of the revolution was work in theoretical computer science. Uh, there, there, there is a whole litany of intractable problems, sharp P complete problems, NP complete problems. And what happened is a group of computer scientists figured out that you could, well, you might not be able to compute exactly what you wanted, but you could compute very accurate approximations to what you wanted in polynomial time, and then you could get them as accurate as you wanted in polynomial time. And that was a, a huge theoretical breakthrough um, that also made people, and all of the computations and the proofs were done by suitable Markov chains. And underlying and interacting with all of those areas is new mathematics. Uh, that, that is, there, there just are things that, that have come up in the last few years that allow us to do, make progress. And so that's very broadly uh, what, the, uh, what the picture is. Now, if I talk about the new mathematics, well, again, in a very broad way, I won't be broad for much longer, don't get nervous. Uh, but in a very broad way, the, the mathematics that has been so useful is a combination with interactions uh, between four areas, uh, probability theory, um, and which I'll be talking about, group theory, which I won't be talking much about, but in fact, if you have a problem that has a group operating on it, you can use the character theory of the group in order to do what you want. And then you can, so the group, 100 years of group theory feeds right into this program and is, is very, very useful. And then you can solve problems that you want by comparison with the neat solutions. So you, there's, a, there's a technique of making neat solutions, solving those using group theory, and then a comparison theory that lets you get answers to the questions that you really care about. Um, the comparison theory and, and much else um, is, is called by me at any rate the, uh, the uh, 
geometric theory of uh, Markov chains, and that borrows techniques from partial differential equations, um, uh, things like the study of decay of the heat kernel, and can you hear the shape of the drum? How does the geometry of a space interact with the eigenvalues of the Laplacian? And um, with, with geometry uh, uh, more formally, and so these areas all interact and feed into the, uh, uh, the mathematical progress. Now, in giving a public talk you, of this type, you have two choices. One is to survey, and the other is to do a few examples. And my feeling is at this hour uh, of the conference and after so many talks, if I try to actually explain all of this stuff, you would all hate me. And <laughs> I might hate you too. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is talk about some simple examples. And uh, so it'll be a thread through this material. But I hope I capture for you some of the excitement and give you a feeling for what a theorem in the subject looks like. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about uh, for a while, most of the talk, are various methods of shuffling cards. And uh, I'll get to real shuffling of real cards in a while, but I want first to talk about the following problem, which I think we also can all relate to. Suppose you had many, many file folders, as we all seem to, and they were in piles in your office, or, and, uh, and every once in a while you use them. And when you use one, well, you have to go find it. And it makes sense to have files that you use more often near the top of the pile. That would be a reasonable thing to do. Okay, so let me make a mathematical model for that, a simple one, but still one that is very useful and natural. So I'll suppose we have n folders, which I may occasionally confuse with playing cards, uh, and that you use the ith folder with propensity w sub i. So w1 up to wn are certain non-negative numbers. They sum to 1, and you know, wi is the propensity of using the ith folder. And what you do is start out, say, with the folders in order, folder 1, 2, and so on, up to n. And a common sense rule is if you just used folder i, put it back on top. Okay? So, that is a typical example of a Markov chain. And I observe to you that you could use that rule without knowing what the weights are, because of course you don't know what the weights are. But if you just put frequently used folders on top, um, that, that, that's a reasonable thing to do. That, that model is often called the Setlin library. I think after Setlin, the wonderful Russian mathematician who was involved with Gelfand. Um, uh, in he, he was talking about having a row of books and a book is removed and put back at the front of the row. And that's why it's sometimes called the Setlin library problem. Now, when one makes mathematics out of that, one introduces the state space. The state space is the set of all n factorial arrangements of the n folders, so the symmetric group, if you like. And um, we have weights, wi, which sum to 1. And the chance of moving from one permutation to a second is wi, if you can get from pi to sigma by moving folder i to the top, that's what that notation says, and zero otherwise. Okay, so you should think of an n factorial by n factorial matrix, and that's the pi sigma entry of that matrix. And clearly it's the chance in this scheme of moving, um, of moving to the top. Um, We'll be studying rearrangements of the folders, and so the notation we use is k squared of pi sigma. The chance, in English, the chance of moving from pi to sigma in two steps, pi and sigma are arrangements, is given by that recipe, and it's simple, where, there's, where does that come from? After all, in order to get to sigma, you have to have gone someplace, your first step, eta, and then from eta to sigma. And if you look, that's just the square of the matrix. It's the pi sigma entry of the square of the matrix. And so similarly, one would define k upper L of pi sigma, the chance of going from arrangement pi to arrangement sigma in L steps. Uh, okay, so, so that's our 
givens as a Markov chain, I'm going to try this two-tiered approach and we'll see if it works. One of the features of, let's, uh, you know, yeah, I, I could never see that one very clearly. This one's brighter. Maybe that's why everybody's been using it anyway. I can't help it at the moment. One of the features of Markov chain theory is that there's a long-run distribution. That is, it's intuitively clear that if I do this pulling to the top a, a long time, things will settle down and so that there's a certain limiting chance that the folders or the cards are in a given arrangement. And um, that's called the stationary distribution. And it's a set of numbers which are non-negative. Uh, in fact, they're all positive. And they sum to 1. And pi of sigma represents the chance that the folders are in the arrangement sigma after a great many steps. Um, more formally, it's a left eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. So if you think of, if you think of k pi sigma as a matrix, um, then the stationary distribution pi runs through the equation in that way. Uh, that's one interpretation of the stationary distribution. And another is this long-term frequency interpretation. If you start the folders off in any arrangement whatsoever, and if you ask the chance after many, many steps, how likely is it that I'm at tau, say, that converges to this limiting distribution pi of tau. And um, as an example, it, first of all, again, it's intuitively clear that if I'm moving folders to the top with different propensities, the stationary distribution would have folders with high weights near the top. Certainly, that's right. Well, here's what the stationary distribution is for, um, for random to top. I'll explain. It's given by a formula there. But imagine putting the weights into a bucket and sampling without replacement. That is, pulling out a, a, a first weight with probability wi and then pulling out a second weight with probability proportional to wj within the remaining ones, and then pull out a third weight with probability propor proportional to its weight within the remaining ones, and so forth. That is, sample from the weights without replacement. Algebraically, the formula is a simple thing to write down. And um, that, that's what the stationary distribution is. And just to help, maybe if you don't want to think about weights, it might be that the weights are all random, so that what you're doing is repeatedly taking a random card and putting it to the top. Then you can check that if the weights are 1 over n, that this thing is 1 over n factorial which accords with the idea that if you mix cards sort of in that random way, they would get all mixed up. So there's the ingredients of a Markov chain are a chain and its stationary distribution. And one of the basic questions, uh, there are others, but this is one I'm going to talk about, is how fast? Um, how fast does this convergence take place? And that's a crucial question in computational issues where somebody comes up with a scheme, runs a Markov chain, and then how long do they have to run it until it's done what it's supposed to do? Um, and it's also a crucial aspect of proving theorems in computer science uh, where one talks about rapidly mixing chains. One way of measuring the speed of convergence is by this recipe. Um, so the distance of my Markov chain after L steps to stationarity, that's what's there on the left, is defined as what's called the total variation distance. It's the maximum over all subsets of the chance that you're in that subset to, to the stationary probability of that subset. And that happens to be equal to 1 half the L1 norm. And so let me try to make that make sense. Even if you don't like probability images, I think everybody can understand this image. Um, the typical problem is this. You've got a big matrix. You're raising it to a high power. Theory says that all of the rows become approximately equal to the same vector, which is the stationary vector. And um, the problem is how, how, how long does it take to get close where you measure closeness in the L1 norm? So, so that's a, a math question. I've written down an actual math question at the bottom that is given an epsilon, how large should L be so that k sub L minus pi is less than epsilon. Um, that, that translates into a, into a math question. What I want to do is to prove a typical 
theorem. Let me state the theorem. This is for the chain in which the, the, there are weights, W1 up to Wn, and that's an upper bound. That is, the, the distance to stationarity after L steps is less than or equal to that right-hand side, and of course, if you know the Ws, you can bound the right-hand side. Let me just give you an example. Um, take the case in which the weights are all 1 over N, okay? So now, I'm going to say the inverse shuffle because it's easier to picture. Um, I've been talking about taking a random card out and putting it on top, but it's the same thing. Take, a, take, take the top card off at random and put it in the middle of the deck. Okay, so you're just poking the cards in. How long does it take to mix up? When say N is 52, you know, how, how long should it be? Um, well, if you put WI equals 1 over N, then that bound becomes N times 1 minus 1 over N, and that will be small, less than or equal to E to the minus C, if n is, sorry, if L, the number of steps you take, is n log n plus cn. Uh, that is, just use the inequality, 1 minus x is less than or equal to e to the minus x, and you can see that. And so when n is 52, for example, log of 52 is about 4, maybe, or so, and so it takes about 200 pokes to mix up 52 cards. And the result is sharp, that is, this is just an upper bound, but the result is sharp in the sense that one can prove that if you go n log n minus a constant times n, then the total variation distance is essentially 1. Now, I want to stop here and point out a feature of this, um, which is maybe one of the most surprising things we've discovered. It's called the cutoff phenomena. And here's what it's about. You might think, as you shuffle cards, more and more, they just get more and more mixed. What else could happen? Well, it's not like that. If you make a graph of the distance of stationarity, this is, this is the, the distance, KL minus pi, and this is L here. If you make a graph of that approach, it stays very close to 1, and then all of a sudden it cuts down close to zero and then it goes exponentially fast to zero. So there's something like a phase transition there and that happens at n log n. So there's a well-defined answer, as it were, to how long do you have to shuffle. Now, I want to explain one of our tools and um, so let me explain it. So I'm going to prove this theorem to you in the air without writing down anything, but I think you'll all be convinced, or I hope so. Uh, we can take a vote. Uh, okay, so this technique I'm going to tell you about is called coupling, the method of coupling, and here's how it goes. I start out with my folders arranged in order, one up to n, okay? And um, I'm going to do the, the case of removing cards and putting them on top. Okay, so I've got my, say, deck of cards arranged here, one up to n. Okay, now I've got a second deck of cards, which is perfectly mixed. That is, it's, it's sampled from the stationary distribution. Okay. Now, I take a third deck, but there are only three. <laughs> and I, I pick a card from the third deck with probability wi. Say it's card number seven. From the first deck, I take card seven, and I move it to the top. From the second deck, I take card labeled seven, and I move it to the top. Okay, from each deck's perspective, I chose a random card, and I moved it to the top. Now, put seven back in that third deck, pick a card out, say it's nine, take the two nines out, put them to the top. As you go on, what you notice is the cards are matching up. They're pairing up from top down. Now, notice if someplace down in the middle, I choose seven again, Seven is paired, but everything above it is paired. So if I take the two sevens out and put them on top, everything stays paired. So the number of matching cards either stays the same or increases. And the first time in which you've touched every card, the two decks are in the same order. Right? <laughs> okay. But this deck, this second deck, was random. It started out in the stationary distribution, and if you shuffle a random deck, it stays random. Okay, so this deck is random. So this deck is random. <laughs> so that seems like a magic trick, but it's a perfectly rigorizable argument. It's called a coupling argument. And um, we're going to see plenty more of them. Uh, let me parse it. Or 
So the proof is by coupling, and what it says there is let T be the first time that all the cards are chosen. That is the first time the two decks match up. Okay. There's a very easy piece of elementary analysis which says that the total variation distance is bounded above by the chance that you haven't coupled up to time L. And then it's Again, even easier to bound the chance that you haven't coupled the time L, that's the chance that you haven't, that's bounded above by the chance that you haven't chosen one, co one of the cards in L steps. Well, that's bounded by this sum, 1 minus Wy to the L. So the analysis part of it is, is quite easy. And um, so that's an example of a coupling bound. Now, in all of the chains I'm going to be telling you about today, in particular this one, there's another small miracle that happens. So this matrix, this n factorial by n factorial matrix, is not a symmetric matrix. It's some yucky matrix that depends on n parameters, the WIs, it's family of matrices. For some reason, well, I can prove it, these matrices are all diagonalizable, explicitly diagonalizable, with eigenvalues which are positive numbers, or zero, and the eigenvalues are explicitly given in terms of the weights. That is, there's an eigenvalue for each s subset S, and uh, that eigenvalue is the sum of, of the weights in that set S, and the multiplicity of that eigenvalue is the number of permutations in the symmetric group whose fixed point set is S, and, and the matrices are all diagonalizable. And that's going to be recurring, and while I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to, prove very much of that. I, I'll, I'll try to tell you why it's interesting as we go along. Um, I want to make a remark on coupling. Well, let me say it in general. Um, so suppose I, I've said, I just gave you an example of a coupling for a specific chain, right? And you could ask, well, isn't that awfully specific? Um, well, no, it's not. Suppose you had any finite set and any Markov chain with a stationary distribution pi, and for the experts, suppose it's ergodic. Um, then, in fact, there exists a coupling. There is one of these arguments. You can put the two, you can make two random walks on a common space so that the first time that they touch is equal to the total variation distance. So th this argument is perfect in its spirit. And um, now finding such an optimal coupling is not necessarily an easy task. But at any rate, such coupling arguments always exist. Um, okay, so um, just to, if, if you're bored or anyway want a problem to think about, let me give you a problem. Um, I hope with this size audience, maybe I'll trick somebody into solving it. It's open. Um, Another scheme that's used, this Setlin library scheme, is the most widely used dynamic storage allocation algorithm. When people move files around in computers, the way they do it is, when they allow themselves to do it, is to very often, most often, is to, is to move a file that was just used to the front. But, of course, that's a very vigorous way of moving, and you might think, well, a, a less vigorous thing to do would be to just move it up by one. Okay, so, you know, you choose a folder with weight wi and move it up by one. Don't put it back one up from where it moved. So, I, I tried to indicate that there. That's, again, a Markov chain. It has a different stationary distribution, but it's not too hard to figure out what the stationary distribution is. Um, and the rates for this chain are completely unknown. Nobody has any real idea of, e except in the case, except in the case in which all of the weights are 1 over n, in which I solved that problem with Laurent Solov cost, and it's actually equivalent to what beta did in the original beta ansatz. Um, so what beta did was to explicitly diagonalize a certain Hamiltonian. It turns out that that Hamiltonian, the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian, are the eigenvalues for this problem, and using his work or using our work, we can solve that problem. The answer is when the weights are all uh, equal, it's n cubed log n is where the transition happens. Um, but nobody knows a coupling, so if you're sitting there, you might think, okay, I'm moving things up, and you know, I've got to have another deck and move things up. How could I get them to match up? And uh, 
well, let me know if you make progress. Um, we'd love to know. Okay, so that's the end of the first example, uh, a, a simple Markov chain and an introduction to the, to the coupling argument. Um, the next thing I, I, I want to talk about is the most familiar method of shuffling cards, which is riffle shuffling. And uh, what I mean by riffle shuffling is what you all mean, maybe at least in America and many Western countries. Uh, you, you have a deck of cards, you cut it about in half, and you go brrrt the way you do, you know, you shuffle them. And uh, so the problem is, how many shuffles does it take to mix up n cards? And just to make mathematics out of that, uh, I'll say it this way, and, and you can look at it if you like. Um, so let me describe more carefully what I mean by brrrt. <laughs> um, so you cut the deck of cards in half approximately according to a binomial distribution. That's a discrete version of the bell-shaped curve. So the chance that you cut off j cards is n choose j over one, one over two to the over two to the n. Anyway, so you cut off about half the cards, and then you start riffling them with your thumbs, and the rule is as follows. If at any point you have A cards here and B cards here, the chance that you drop the next card is A over A plus B. That is, the probability of dropping this card next is proportional to the packet size. So what that means is you're more likely to drop a card from the bigger pile, and then maybe a little more likely, and then when that gets littler, then it's more likely to go here. So that's a completely specified measure on the symmetric group now. Um, it was invented by uh, Ed Gilbert and Claude Shannon, and worked on by Jim Reeds. And um, one feature, whether you like my description or not, is I've done a fair amount of experimenting, and it's a very good match to the way real people shuffle real cards. Uh, so it's a reasonable um, model to analyze. Um, the stationary distribution, of course, is uniform. If you shuffle cards a lot, they get all mixed up. I mean, that's certainly true. Now, before I enter into the mechanics of this argument, uh, you can ask, well, wait a second. Now, I know something about shuffling cards. Does it actually matter? Does anything I say matter? And before we did this work, uh, people used to think if you shuffle cards three, four, five times, they're mixed up. And it's just wrong, like so many other things that people believe. And, and um, uh, so I want to tell you the answer before doing much of anything else. Um, so this is work I did with Dave Beyer, uh, algebraic geometer at Columbia. And here's the way the theorem looks for this Gilbert Shannon Reads measure. I have n cards, and then L is going to be the number of times I shuffle. Now I've written L in a rather funny way. I've written L as three halves log to the base two of n plus c. But of course, if you told me n, the deck size, and L, how many times you plan to shuffle, that defines c as a function of n and L. So, the theorem is that the total variation distance to stationarity is well approximated, that well approximated, by, by the right-hand side. And um, that, yeah, where phi is the normal, is the normal curve, I, I won't, well, I can write it out. Phi, phi is the normal, the Gaussian density. Phi of x, one over square root of two pi integral minus infinity to x e to the minus t squared over 2. And that doesn't help you so much unless you know about the normal density, but what it says is that there's a very sharp threshold at 3 halves log to the base 2 of n. Beyond that, it goes exponentially fast in c, and before that, it actually goes to 1 doubly exponentially fast. There's a very, very sharp threshold. Now, this is an asymptotic result, and you should learn to question asymptotic results. Um, let me show you the actual numbers. Um, so these aren't from that formula. These are from an exact computation. I have these numbers to 70 places of rational arithmetic. I didn't think you'd want to see those. This is the total variation distance for n equals 52 after L shuffles, where, so when L is, when L is 1, uh, the total variation distance is one to four decimal places. The total variation distance is a number between zero and one. And um, it stays at one 
up to four or five shuffles, and then it starts to go down. It's 0 0.614, 0 0.334, 0 0.167, and that pattern continues forever. That is, uh, it goes down by a factor of two each time forever. Okay, and that's, a, that's a theorem. I'm not just whistling <laughs> uh, here. And, and so what you can see is that there's a very sharp threshold at, you know, around seven, and so I code that up by saying it takes seven shuffles, but of course, you have to go back to the original math question. It, you have to tell me how close to random it is. It's not never exactly random. And this formula says if you tell me epsilon, I can tell you what C is and therefore how, how long we have to shuffle. So this is what this shuffling thing looks as a statement of a theorem. Let me give you a coupling argument um, for this theorem or essentially this theorem. And, um, the argument I'm about to give you works not just for riffle shuffles, but somewhat more generally, so let me try to say it somewhat more generally. Remember my folders? I was choosing a folder, moving it to the top. Suppose I choose instead of one folder, I choose a set of folders. So let S be a subset of one up to N, like 135. Then you could imagine removing cards labeled 1, 3, and 5, keeping them there in their same relative order and moving them to the top. Okay, that's inverse shuffling, right? Shuffling is cutting some cards off and putting them in. Inverse shuffling is removing some cards and putting them on top. I'm now going to allow general weights. Um, if the weights are one over two to the n, so if you choose a random subset, you can do the little mental exercise that this Gilbert Shannon Reads model, which I described as shuffle sequentially, is exactly the same as removing a random subset and, well, Anyway, removing, the inverse of it is removing a random subset, uniformly chosen, and, and, and moving it to the top. Um, okay, so picture with me repeatedly removing subsets and putting them to the top. Now, I've got two decks of cards. One is in its original order, one up to N, and one is mixed up, random, okay? So I pick a subset, 135, I remove cards 135, I put them on top, I remove cards 135, I put them on top. I just keep doing that. Okay. Now, let capital T be the first time that every pair of cards has been separated. By separated, I mean that either I is in S and J is in the complement, or I is in the complement and J is in S. Okay, so look at the first time that every pair of cards has been separated. Now, I claim that that's a coupling time. Let's say that argument. Um, when a pair of cards has been separated, they're in the same relative order in the two decks. If I was in S, then I is above S in both decks, okay? Once they're in the same relative order in both decks, they stay in the same relative order forever afterwards because either they're in the same subset or the complement, in which case they're not separated, or they're separated, okay? So once every pair of cards has been separated, the two decks are in the same relative order. So that's a second example of a coupling time. And, um, well, what you can see from that is that the coupling bound would, um, would give you this. Uh, in general, um, let T be the first time every card is separated. Um, the total variation distance is bounded above by the, this chance of separating i and j to the elf power. Just to do a specific example, um, if I take a random subset out, that means really choosing a subset at random, well, the chance that cards i and j are separated is a half then, because wherever i goes, the chance that j goes with it is a half. Um, the, ch the chance that j doesn't is a half, so then the bound becomes n choose 2, that's the number of pairs i and j, times a half to the l. And if you look at that, you can see that l has to be of order log n in order to make that small. That's the way, that's the way those asymptotics go. I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's worth saying that all of these chains for any choice of weights give explicitly diagonal, diagonalizable Markov chains with known eigenvalues. For a second, I want to mention one last example. It's just there at the bottom, and let me just say it out here in the air, if you don't mind. Um, instead of choosing weights of, on a subset, 
There's another generalization, which is in a sense that I'll make specific, the ultimate generalization. I, I could choose a, what I call a block-ordered partition. So take a partition of n, 1, 3, and 5, 2, 4, 6, 8, you know, take some partition, and the shuffle is the following. Remove cards 1, 3, and 5, put them on top. Remove cards 2, 4, 6, 8, put them underneath. Remove the next block. Okay, so the, a block-ordered partition is, uh, <laughs> gives you a method of shuffling once you've chosen, once you've chosen weights on it. And, and, well, in casinos, they sometimes shuffle cards um, very vigorously, and that same coupling argument works for block-ordered partitions. Okay, now, so for a moment, that's the end of the shuffling story. Um, and I'm now going to talk a little about geometry, but I promise you the geometry is related to shuffling. Okay, so normally I would say, are there any questions? But don't do that to me. I don't want any questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so a beautiful part of classical geometry is the mathematics of hyperplane arrangements. And what I mean for here is a bunch of affine hyperplanes in a Euclidean space. Finite number of hyperplanes, H1 up to Hn. And those hyperplanes uh, divide space up into chambers. And you can see the chambers uh, in, in what's there. This is a chamber, this is a chamber, this is a chamber, etc. And what I'm going to do is to define a random walk on the chambers of a hyperplane arrangement. Um, and here's how it goes. Um, in addition to the chambers, there are faces. So for example, this is a face. A face of a hyperplane arrangement is you're on certain of the hyperplanes and on ver various sides of other hyperplanes. And so this is a face, and vertices are faces, and chambers are faces, etc. Suppose you had a hyperplane arrangement, anyone, I don't care, and put arbitrary system of weights on the faces. Um, here, here's how the walk goes. You're at a chamber, say I'm at this chamber. Pick a face from your probability distribution. Say I pick this face, okay? Now move to the chamber adjacent to the face you chose and in the closest way. So here, I could go here, here, or here, here. The distance of this face to this chamber is two. And for example, if I, I couldn't wind up here because that would be, well, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five to get to. It, you have to cross a face every time. So move, so I would, I, I, I would wind up here. Okay, so that, that is this a projection operator of, of faces on chambers, uh, which a face times a chamber is again a chamber, and I've indicated it geometrically. Um, in symbols, maybe it'll help. I don't know if it helps anyway. It's not very long. Um, uh, a face is given by the intersection of various objects, well, let's say, a hyperplane divides space up into three regions, on the hyperplane, on one side of the hyperplane, or on the other side of the hyperplane. Choose sides once and for all, and we keep them fixed. And so H0 is on the hyperplane, H plus is on the right side, H minus is on the left side. A face is an intersection of some of these HI, FIs, where FI can be 0, plus, or minus 1. It just says which hyperplanes you're on and which side of the others you're, you're, you're on. A chamber is given by the intersection of uh, the intersection of full dimensional half spaces, that is HI to the CI, where CI is plus or minus one. Algebraically, the product of a face on a chamber is given by this recipe. It's HI to the epsilon I, where epsilon I is FI if FI is non-zero, so the side, the side of the i hyperplane that you're on de determines. But if you're on a hyperplane, then the side of the chamber that you're on in the original chamber determines. Anyway, that gives a, that's algebraically the product, and, um, uh, and the, the product of a chamber with a chamber is, again, a... Uh, a chamber. Um, uh, Pat Bidegar, Phil Hanlon, and Dan Rockmore suggested and studied um, this funny problem. Uh, 
suppose you have an arbitrary system of weights on the faces of a hyperplane arrangement. Use that to define a random walk in the obvious way. If you're at a chamber, pick a new face and move there, and that's your walk. In symbols, the, tr the transition, the chance of going from C prime to C, is the sum of the weights of all of the faces, such that if you multiply C prime by, the, by F, you get C. Okay, so if I like, that's a random walk, okay. Um, some work I did with Ken Brown um, showed that this random walk, under very minimal assumptions, has a unique stationary distribution. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's something very close to sampling without replacement. Uh, but we can say what it is in terms of, of the, the face weights. And the coupling, a coupling type argument um, gives this bound. Um, that is, after m steps, the chance that I'm, you know, the ba bound on the distance to stationarity is given by that right-hand side. And you should be able to figure out the coupling yourself. That is, you just wait until you're on the same side of every hyperplane. So you should, you should see that from, from what I've said. So theta i is the chance that you separate the ith hyperplane um, in, in one step. And um, I find remarkable the a algebraic side of their work and some of our work. Um, it turns out that this matrix, this family of matrices, have real positive eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are indexed by what's called the intersection lattice of the hyperplane uh, arrangement. That is, look at the set of all possible intersections of the hyperplanes that you have. That forms a lattice. And for every element of that lattice, there is an eigenvalue. The eigenvalue lambda sub L is given by the sum of the weights and the faces which are contained in, in that subspace. Um, the multiplicity of the eigenvalue is the Merbius function of, uh, of the, that element of the lattice. And with Ken uh, Brown, we showed that, um, that this matrix is indeed diagonalizable. So this is some giant class of odd <laughs> diagonalizable matrices. Let me do one quick example. This is an easy one to follow. It's the dihedral arrangement. So you have n lines in the plane. Okay? And so the chambers are these wedges. And here's the way I think about it. Um, you have, a, a, and I'm going to choose weights on the half lines. There's a weight for every half line, just to, to make a choice. So I think this way. There's a circular house, and there's a mouse who lives in the walls. Okay? And the mouse pops up every once in a while in a wall. And there's a cat who lives in the rooms. And when the cat hears the mouse in a wall, it moves to the room adjacent to the mouse, and it waits there, hoping to get the cat. Anyway, that's what that walk would become. Um, when I said we know the stationary distribution explicitly, this is what it is. If you have a chamber bounded by sides L and L prime, um, the stationary probability is given by an explicit formula in terms of the weights. The eigenvalues are explicit numbers. They're given by partial sums of the weights, and there's a the Merbius function, I, I won't bother to, to define more carefully. OK, the connection, of course, between talk one and what I just did is through the braid arrangement. So you maybe have seen this. One of the famous hyperplane arrangements is the braid arrangement, which working in Euclidean end space there's a hyperplane Hij for every i not equal to j, and that hyperplane is the set of all x1 up to xn where the ith coordinate is equal to the jth coordinate. Okay? So those are certain hyperplanes. The chambers are parts of Euclidean space, and there's a relative order of the coordinates inside of a chamber. And any point inside the chamber has the same relative order because you haven't crossed a wall, and so the chambers are indexed by permutations. Okay. And the faces are indexed by block-ordered partitions. And the action of a face on a chamber is exactly riffle shuffling. Okay. So 
this hyperplane stuff generalizes all of the earlier shuffling stuff. I mean, and, and all of the earlier theorems go through in, in, in this kind of generality. Now, there's a world of people who work on hyperplane arrangements. And to be honest, I have some friends who do it. I always thought, hmm, hyperplane arrangements, all right. That's what you do, that's what you do. But now I'm very interested. Um, there are many, many hyperplane arrangements um, in, which, uh, in which the chambers are indexed by natural combinatorial objects. I'll just say one, the tilings of, um, say, n-gons. Um, so in parts of mathematical physics, people are very, in quasi-crystals and things like that, people are very interested in the set of all tilings of a given region by regions of a given type. And um, I've shown here at the top two different tilings of a, maybe it's a 10-gon, I don't know. Um, those are zonotopal tilings, that is, they're tilings by zonotopes, whatever they are, which have the same sides which are parallel to the original 10-gon. Uh, the left one is what's called realizable. There's a three-dimensional object which projects to that. The right one is not realizable. There's no three-dimensional object. Anyway, people are interested in the set of all tilings in various senses, as well as a beautiful theorem of um, Lubelera and Bert Sturmfels, which says that the realizable tilings of a zonotope are themselves the vertices of a zonotope or the chambers of a hyperplane arrangement. And I've just shown you an example here. If I take a hexagon, okay, there are hexagon, an octagon, how many octagon? If I take an octagon and I tile it with rhombuses, there are eight different tilings of an octagon by rhombuses, and I've drawn them all out. But what you can see is, actually, they're the vertices of an octagon themselves. That is, each of those tilings differs from the other by a flip. Um, for example, I get from this one to this one by taking this down arrow and making it go up here, right, by a simple flip move. Well, that's true in general. That is, the set of all realizable tilings of any zonotope uh, is itself the vertices of another zonotope. And what that means is that we can do a random walk on tilings, which is very vigorous. Let me try to explain. The physicists have been using local walks in which they go from one tiling to another by making a local flip. That's like mixing up cards by transposing adjacent cards. It's a slow way to mix things. We have the analog of riffle shuffling. Okay, we have a very vigorous way of doing it, and so it, 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 it's interesting, it's also analyzable, and so there are hundreds of examples like that. I'm not going to tell you any more. Um, this talk was titled something strange. Um, it, was, it was titled um, From Shuffling Cards to Walking Around the Building. So I want to at least get myself to walking around the building. Um, now, there's not much hope of trying to tell you very carefully what a building is, but I hope that this is better than saying, and it all goes through for buildings. That's one way of <laughs> saying it. Uh, I'm not going to parse this so much, but um, a, a building is a certain type of simplicial complex, so a set of simplices, which is given as divided up into apartments, which are subcomplexes. And the subcomplexes are essentially hyperplane arrangements, isomorphic to hyperplane arrangements, where the hyperplane arrangements are, in fact, given by reflection groups. Okay, so a building is certain neat hyperplane arrangements stuck together. And here's a very simple example. Um, this is a building which has um, three apartments. The apartments are these hexagons. So there's a hexagon, there's a hexagon, and the outer one's a hexagon. And buildings, the top dimensional simplices are called chambers. And the chambers here are the little uh, edges of the graph. And, uh, um,